Welcome to the Literary House in Lillehammer. My name is Matthias Sommersen. I'm the artistic advisor for the festival, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you an event we have called Johan versus John. Um, to start with John, this is his fourth year at the festival, um, and uh, he's become uh, an important part of um, the international focus that we have. We often rely on him to to contribute with um, a sort of gaze from the outside uh, on some of our Norwegian authors. He is the editor of the magazine Freemans. He's the author of several books concerning literature and society, and not least, a marvelous poetry collection called Maps. Today, he will be talking to Johan Hashta who many of you know, I think. Uh, since his debut in 2001, he's been one of the most interesting authors in Norway. Every book he publishes does something new, and this makes for a dynamic authorship that demands a certain flexibility from the reader. That being said, the books are always devastating in their humor and glorious in their ambition. Welcome to Johan versus John. Hi, thanks for having us. It's um, really nice to be here. Uh, thank you, Matthias, for bringing me back to talk to one of my favorite writers. Um, I think we have two kinds of favorite writers. There's the writer that you know very well. You've read their books, you've reread them, and then there's the kind of writer that you have read some of and want to read everything else that comes. And this is that kind of writer for me, Johan, because I um, speak English and uh, two and a half of his books have been translated into English. Unfortunately, not this one, although I've read sections of it. So the conversation we're gonna have is um, unusual in that you probably have read more of him than I have. Um, you have lived <coughs> under an uncloudy sky and have seen the whole galaxy. <laughs> and I live in a very cloudy country, um, and I can only <coughs> imagine the scale of things. Um, but I, to begin our conversation, um, uh, We'll get to Max Misha and the Tet Offensive, but given that we're almost 50 years from the moon landing, mm. um, and you wrote two books, uh, 172 Hours on the Moon, which if you haven't read, involves three teenagers going to the moon and discovering their doppelgangers there, and their doppelgangers are murderous um, other beings who take over their lives. And Buzz Aldrin, um, which is a story of a gardener who wants to be second best and has taken as his hero, not the first person to land on the moon, but the second. Um, and that becomes almost like a philosophy. And anyway, these two books are in the shadow of the moon, and in all of your books, people are looking at themselves, often in the shadow of spectacular things, of miraculous things. And yet every one of your books discovers the miraculous in consciousness in everyday life. Can you talk a little bit about what it means to live 50 years on from the moon landing now, where the miraculous um, is often terrifying. It's mm. either terrorism or it's the new launch of an album by Rihanna. It's you know a, a, an action film in, in 3D. We're kind of gorging on the miraculous. And what kind of role does the miraculous play, I guess, in in everyday life, whether secular or not. Hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. The, the other day, like a couple of days ago, I saw this video on YouTube, which NASA has put out, uh, talking about them going back to the moon and like this time we're going to stay. And it's, it's this four minute video with a lot of, you know, very heroic music. And uh, there's a lot of uh, talking heads in there explaining all the different aspects of this mission and do 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 do. And on the one side, I almost got the same sensation as my guess would people had in the early 60s when it was decided that we were going to the moon, you know. And, uh, and in this video, they described not only creating a sort of uh, forward operating base on the moon, but also that this is going to be the stepping stone for our mission to Mars and, you know, to infinity and beyond, basically. <laughs> uh, but on the other, on the other hand, it was also a little bit of, um, also, also felt a little bit sad when I was, was watching it because 
If this had been 1961 or something, it would have been absolutely breaking news all over the world. We're going to the moon. Now it's just four minute video amongst, you know, millions of videos on YouTube that just happened to show up in my, in my, you know, recommended feed or something. And I can't have it. I didn't know about it before, so maybe it's been in the news, you know, but like a little small thing. So, you know, th these are strange times we live in, sort of. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm ans answering you, your question correctly, so, so, so feel free to interrupt me at any time, but there's a certain sadness, I think, because all these uh, seemingly great things are sort of overlooked and the focus is on all the stuff that isn't working. It's, you know, we're living in the new 30s in many ways. Um, what do you mean by that? I mean, you know, like fa fascism is obviously growing. There's a lot of, the, the, the whole idea of fake news, for instance, was also very, very um, real in, in Germany in the, in the early 30s disinformation, active disinformation, this mistrusting the, the on a national level uh, idea that someone else is to blame for, you know, economic or social failure, etc., etc. And the whole, the whole Id concept of these building fronts and that is getting harder and harder to have an, a real argument between, mm. you know, political sides because we are at the point where one side is just grinding on with their view and the other part is almost too tired to, you know, mm. talk back or fight back. Um, <laughs> this is a completely other different discussion though, but, uh, but I'm, I'm, really, I'm really afraid of uh, the direction things are going. So I think this would definitely be a good time for, for people wanting to, to, you know, settle for being second best. And when I wrote the book, Buzz Aldrin, I was, you know, it, this was before Facebook was a big thing. It was before Instagram. It was, it was basically based on the whole, you know, idea of the, the idols and the, the, the early, um, what do you call it, the, um, <clears throat> you know, TV, TV shows. But, but now I think it translates into something else. It translates into maybe we should just take a step back and see what we have instead of aiming for something that isn't necess necessarily good for anyone. Mm. If that Re makes sense. Johan's books from Ambulance, his first story collection, which is a series of linked stories in which an ambulance figures in every single one of them. Um, to uh, Max Misha and the Tet Offensive, you, you do something narratively, which I would call uh, almost like drone technology. Mm. So in the first story, an ambulance called Ambulance, this guy is being taken to the hospital and he floats outside of the ambulance and he looks down on himself um, being taken to the hospital. And, and in that way, Johan sort of tells you the story of this man's life and what has brought him to this moment. And in Max Mies and the Tet Offensive, which involves, a, a, among other things, a kid named Max who goes to America in 1989 with his family when his father is hired to work for American Airlines and he moves to Long Island. In, in one of the sections, the one that I ran, Max is in Stravanger, where you grew up, um, and he's, he's, walk, he's on a run with his classmates and he mm -hmm. floats above himself and sees the landscape. And I wonder if, as a, as a novelist working in today, where you can write in first, second, or third person, you, you've written almost all genres. This is science mm. fiction. You've written a kind of fantasy. Your most recent book is a kind of play on, on crime fiction. Is, is there something about um, seeing us just a tiny bit from above that allows you to, to address what you just talked about, the kind of mm. the things around us which we don't see? Hopefully, I, I think that's correct. I think that is one of the abilities of literature. I mean, you, you can go in on an extreme close-up on something, but you can also try to give 
uh, an overview from, from your point of view or from the protagonist's point of view. And I really love that freedom of literature to seamlessly move between all these, these forms and shapes of, of telling a story. Uh, but... Hmm. Thinking and talking at the same time is not very very easy. But for instance, for for the for the the section you talked about in Max Misha, where you, where you follow the characters as they run and then you have the overview, it was important to do both in that in that uh, sequence to show first this sort of intimacy that exists between people running or doing something together. You know, th this is this is the group, right? Uh, but it seemed impossible to describe the geography of the of the place from their point of view, and also since it's a book about leaving and uh, you know losing your home or trying to find a new place to call home, I had to do the almost. There's almost like a spaceship leaving, you know, and that is why you you get to see the streets they're running on, and then, then there's all these fields mm. next to it, and then almost the whole city. So, uh, come to think of it, I think I, uh, I've, I've done that quite, <laughs> quite a lot, that <laughs> trick, but... It's in Buzz Aldrin, too. <laughs> <laughs> I have a limited set of you know, <laughs> uh, tricks. No, but I, I like that... That sort of dilation? Yeah. You were in the, your previous answer. You were talking about you know, we're returning to the '30s in many ways, and, and sometimes, personally, I, I believe one of the things that is creating increased tribalism is the inability to do that dilation between mm. self and individual and small tribe and, and big tribe, Republican or Democrat or Norwegian or American or whatever. And you know, throughout all of your books, you're also, you're often referencing. He's the only person I've ever known to drop. Han Solo as a kind of wisdom giver, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I love that. <laughs> but your books are, are there's a drumbeat of, of pop culture throughout them. Mm. And in your memoir, uh, Blizzard, which is also about a, an album called yeah. Blizzard, um, you're kind of weaving between that album and, you know, Star Wars figurines mm. and et cetera. And I, pop culture is so enchanting, you know, because it, it addresses us in a very intimate way. And yet it's also a product, you know, yeah. it's sort of built for obsolescence. And I, I wonder, have we, through the constant ubiquity of, and, and easiness and efficiency of, of our access to pop culture, has that, have we enchanted ourselves away from our access to our own intimacy? I don't think so. I mean, <clears throat> well, there's a couple of things to say. First, first of all, I, I don't... I think pop culture in general gets a little bit of an unfair treatment, you know, because we love it, but we also love to discredit it in mm. a way, to to talk it down. And for me personally, there's never been any real difference between reading, you know, James, Ulysses by James Joyce the one minute and then watching Darth Vader go about his daily business a second later. It's in many ways they're sort of the same thing. Mm. Um, Sorry, I'm just stuck on Darth Vader going to the shop to find milk. <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, I can get a little bit upset when when people try to convince you that one is less worth than the other. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, a lot of time was invested by J James Joyce to create Ulysses. But I would guess a lot of time was invested in creating Darth Vader as well. Uh, and both have, you know, impacted my, my life. Not necessarily Ulysses, I shouldn't talk too much about it, but you know, like the high art and the low art or the high brow and the low brow um, is just the same brow, mm. uh, <laughs> is my point. <laughs> and I always get a little bit suspicious when, when people claim to only, only listen to you. Know, I only listen to classical music. I don't read novels published after 70, 72 or something. Um, and the other thing is, I always get a little bit surprised when asked or confronted about 
the pop culture references in my books because I'm not planting them in there to, you know, as, as name dropping or anything. All these references to music or films or characters in my books are there because they feel very natural to me. They feel natural to me in the same way it feels natural to describe how a building or a street or a person looks, you know, what the weather is like. Because pop culture is we're so saturated by it uh, that it would feel unfair and also unrealistic to pretend it doesn't exist. Mm. And obviously there's the there's the there's school of literature that, that says you shouldn't include pop literary pop cultural references because it dates your 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 piece. And that could be, but I'm not in this business to be read like a thousand years from now. I want to try to describe the world which I'm living in now. Mm. And, you know, hopefully in a thousand years people will be able to Google Husker Du and find out what kind of band it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in Max Misch and the Tet Offensive, the, there's a, a Vietnam War veteran who is a Norwegian who comes to America mm. and then ends up in the Vietnam War. And then there's long sections also about Oliver Stone's platoon. Yep. And in your mind, is it impossible to separate out the, um, the record of lived experience and the mythology created by uh, a, a film like, like, like Platoon? Well, for me, it's impossible. And, and obviously, because I'm, I was born after the, the fighting part of the war was over, and uh, so I was never in, in Vietnam, which meant my connection to, to, say, the Vietnam War came through pop culture being uh, Platoon or Apocalypse Now, for instance, which I, as, as Max in the book, saw for the first time at the age 10 or 11, mm -hmm. um, which was very scary and very boring. And, and then there was all these, and um, maybe some of you know this, but in the early 90s, Marvel um, Comics had this series of... Um, you know, comic magazines called uh, The Nam, which was, I think they, it ran for like 30 issues or something. Uh, and it was highly realistic depictions of the Vietnam War. And the concept was, I think it was written by uh, Vietnam War veterans. And the idea was that one, each issue should cover one month of the war. So it should, you know, uh, coincide with how the war progressed, etc. And for me, as, as you know, nine or ten year olds, reading these comic books about the Vietnam War was absolutely, you know, terrific and horrific. But it's impossible now, even after having been you know, overly interested in the Vietnam War and been reading about it for 25 years, it's still impossible for me to separate uh, the Vietnam as a, as a political or historical uh, happening and these references. So it's, it, it all comes down to, and, and, and you know, there, there's also the idea of the Vietnam War in general for people which is something I tried to, to write about in the book Ambulance, where a character, uh, a woman from Vietnam, having moved to Norway, describes Vietnam as now just a feeling, you know. I feel Vietnam, and it has all these connotations in it. If that yeah, was, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I, I um, lived in Long Island as a child, and I grew up in California. And so this book is some, and this book was also previously titled Cleveland, mm. which I'm really angry that you gave up on um, because there's never been a novel called Cleveland, yeah. and this would have really put Cleveland on the map. Um, so I can tell you why it was called the Cleveland. For Please the, do. Uh, which was also a pop culture reference. Uh, the first idea for the novel was to call it Cleveland, and as I always do, almost before I, I write a single sentence, I make um, the cover design. You know, or at least a, like a sketch up of it. <clears throat> and it was about, a, the cover design was one of those old 
really old uh, renderings of a guy, bearded guy crossing the river Styx. And uh, it was supposed to be the idea that he was dead and was going to Cleveland. And it's a reference to Jim Jarmusch, his dead man in the end, where, uh, where nobody says you're going back uh, to where you belong or something. And, and Johnny Depp says Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> So the idea was that ever when you died, you, you ended up in Cleveland. As, as someone born in Cleveland, I can say it's almost accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, my, my family also lived once in Utica, for, which is the Cleveland of the Rust Belt in New York State. Mm. And someone once asked Stephen King where he got his ideas from, and he said, Utica. <laughs> so, so yeah. But let me ask you, um, wh wh what did these places mean in your imagination? Because I know you, you did a bit of research and mm. went there and talked to people and looked around and went into archives and things. Yeah. Well, did, you, did you try to close the gap between your imagination and the place, or did you try to keep that gap open? A lot of the places in the Max Mission novel are places I visited and uh, almost felt at home in. <laughs> because after I, I, I haven't lived in Slavonia for 20 years, and it's only recently, I think, the last maybe two years since I, I, I had children that, that I felt home in Oslo. Now I consider Oslo being my hometown. But for many years, I felt that was, I was just in transit. So whenever I was traveling, I would come to a new city or a new country, and I would think, could I have lived here? Could this have been my hometown? Not considering moving there, but just, you know, does this have a feeling of, of a place where I could have belonged? And, and obviously you have these places where you wish, wish you belong, you know, going to, into Manhattan and thinking, oh, how cool it would be to be from Manhattan. And then um, acknowledging that I, I couldn't be from here. It's, it's hard to describe why it just doesn't, you know, uh, or, or say Paris or London. I could never be f from these places. So it's always surprised me coming to places where I felt like, okay, this, this could abs absolutely be, be one of those places where I could have belonged. And a couple of, of, of these uh, geographical spots is the city of Perth in uh, Western Australia. Really? Which, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't choose these places, you know. <laughs> and if if you've been there, it's 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 a well, it's a place. It's not the best place in Australia by far. Uh, yeah. It's 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 just a sprawl that never ends, and yeah. there's nothing really to do. Um, it's a lot of pickup trucks, <laughs> yeah. and it's incredibly hot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and another place was the small city of Fairfax in Northern California, yeah. uh, which is much, much nicer, really lush and green and, and lovely in, in so many ways. Um, but also, I think, you know, uh, Garden City on Long Island mm -hmm. sort of reminds me of... Um, of the place I grew up. Even though it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, when I say it reminds me of the place, it's, it's not that the layouts of the streets or the houses are similar in any way, because Garden City in, in Long Island is a really upper middle class to upper class um, area. But, well, parts, parts of Fools where I'm from um, is also that, but it's, it's just a feeling of, you know, this could be the place. and, and how I cho chose it was we rented a car and drove a lot around Long Island. And, and, and it's the same, for instance, I did with the novel Hesselby about Albert Orbach uh, as a child. Um, because in, in the, those children's books, it never stated which city he's, he's living in, or uh, which suburb he's living in. So we drove around the, the suburbs of Stockholm, as I did on Long Island until I suddenly had, okay, this, this must be the place. The sort of aura. So, yeah. Is, is, you, write a, you write a lot about, um, and I don't know if you are doing this on purpose, but about nostalgia. Mm. Sometimes nostalgia before it's become nostalgia. And, you know, when you're writing about Max's childhood in Stavanger, I felt this sort of Max was feeling nostalgic before he even left it and could look back on it mm. to some degree. 
And I, I wonder if, if you can talk about that just as a, almost like a metaphysical experience, but also in what way nostalgia is created by, uh, well, uh, middle classness, hmm. you know, because the, there is a lot of freedom in coming and growing up the way that Max did yeah. because he's, he leaves, you know, because his family leaves, but you're writing a lot about people, except for the woman you mentioned in Ambulance, who leave but their places by choice, mm. as I assume in many ways you have. Yeah. And what, in what way is nostalgia, uh, uh, I guess, a luxury? And I'm not criticizing it at all, no, because no. I'm saturated with nostalgia. I'm just trying to remember what I wrote, because it's, uh, it says something in, in the Max Michel novel that this isn't nostalgia, it's something else, and <laughs> I forgot <laughs> that, what it is. You forgot the word, you forgot what it was. Uh, I forgot my argument, <laughs> I forgot my mantra. Um, but nostalgia is, is difficult, but because it's a good thing you say it's not a criticism, or, or I mean, even it, if it was, but the problem with nostalgia is its, it's connotations are often slightly negative uh, because you're not supposed to have it, in a way. You're not supposed to feel nostalgia for things. Do you think and the Greek roots of the word in its nostos logo is yeah. home longing? Yeah, yeah, but it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it is, but I think the the implications of the word have, have changed, sort of, or, or what we mean by it. And I think... It's closer what, to sentimentalism. Yeah, or let me put it this way. When, when I wrote the section that takes place in Stavanger and Max growing up, um, a lot of these things are they're not my stories, but it's my neighborhood, it's my, it's my streets, right? Yeah. The streets I grew up <clears throat> and. I felt that, okay, now I've lived almost longer away from, from this place than I, you know, the amount of time I, I spent there. And it's not that I wanted to move back, and it's not that it was extreme, <coughs> extremely important for me, but I felt that I was losing it, you know, almost as a memory. So I wanted to give a fair description of that really, really shitty place. Uh, because it's, it's a very industrial suburb, uh, it's a very, very boring suburb, but as they say in the book, it's my suburb, yeah. you know, it's the place I came from, and while we could look up to all these other kids that lived in, you know, in the middle of, of the big, great city of Stavanger, <laughs> or in different big cities in the world, we made these unimportant you know, streets really, really matter. Mm. And so I wanted to give it a fair treatment of how this place would look if you really loved it and felt you belonged there. And, and necessarily there has to be an, an amount of nostalgia since, you know, it is a place he, he comes from and longs back to. But... Um, yeah. But when we meet him um, in America, and he's traveling across the country as a theater director, hmm. he's the theater director, right? Yep. And, and he's, he has a similar feeling about the places he's traveling through. He hmm. arrived w when, in one of the sections, he's arrived and uh, he's, he's slept in his car, yep. and he's, about, he's supposed to be at the Fairmont, which is the nicest hotel in San Francisco. Hmm. And you see the... the how uh, growing up in a place you know you have to leave because it's boring or there's not a lot of opportunity there puts inside you a seed of nostalgia that doesn't ever go in the sense that you can travel to a new landscape and instantly it's both something you're looking at and encountering but knowing in some ways you're going to have to leave it. Mm. And so he, it's like he wants to belong, he wants to be there and yet he's not capable of doing that. Yeah. Which is a problem, I think, and, and this is also a lot of the same mechanism that uh, went on and I finally discovered with my own life because I, I was so preoccupied with thinking that it had been so many years since I left my, uh, my hometown and it, I had spent so long in this transit um, 
way of living that I forgot to, and this is this sounds banal, but it's true, I, I forgot to focus on the life I was living, in a way. I forgot to embrace, in a way, living in Oslo, for instance. Mm. And then suddenly waking up one morning and, and realizing that, okay, that guy on the, on the corner there that sits there smoking cigarettes for eight hours a day, 365 days of the year, he actually matters to me, in a way. He, he's part of... He's part of this um, small, you know, raft we're floating around on, on. Or, okay, I really like when that tree blossoms in spring or, or something. And these are not very good examples, but it's no, what but I'm I think thinking it's about. Th these, it's these maps of the places yeah. we occupy, because we occupy a real place and then we occupy virtual spaces yeah. and then the kind of in between of mediated culture. And these maps are, are enormously important. Mm. And I, I want to ask you, um, because there was a play that came before Max Misha that uh, has some of the same elements. You know, there's, there's a Vietnam War veteran in that yeah. play. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, in, from Ambulance to, to these two books and to what I've read of this one, mm. there's a typical Harstadian uh, paragraph, mm. which begins with a short sentence. There's a slightly longer sentence. And then there's a really long sentence that takes you to the end of the paragraph. Yeah. And sometimes that's done in first person voice, that someone's speaking to you and, and you suddenly realize, oh, there, there hasn't been a period in this whole time. Mm. And other, other times when it's in third person, you're just going deeper and deeper into someone's yeah. life. And it occurred to me whilst reading this, that this is a, very similar to a monologue or this is to mm. theatrical dialogue. And I, I wonder if you can talk about the differences between those two because someone who isn't here but told me you once had a blog about fictional people mm. and they were just sort of talking randomly and he said, yeah. I think Johan deleted that blog, which is yeah. a shame. Mm. First of all, w where do you hear the voices from? Um, and what is, what's the difference between a, a play, someone on stage talking and then building a voice in here that, that, that sounds logical? Mm. Well, I think the, the, the major difference is, is how you write it, I think, because for a for f text or, or a novel, I can do it a little bit more complex because then you, you, know, you can always go back a line and, and reread if you, if you lose track or something. You can do a lot of more put-in stuff and, and basically make it more complex. If it's a monologue to be performed by an actor, it can still be as long as it needs to be, but it, it needs to have a certain different construction, I think, since, it, since it's not going to be, uh, you know, it's, it's through the ears, not through the eyes. Um, but I've... And, and here's the thing, for me, I think sometimes the... Um, I can get a little envious of the English language sometimes because you use commas uh, not as frequent as you have to do in Norwegian. You can have a longer uh, part of a sentence in English without having any sort of punctuation, which gives you a different kind of rhythm. Whereas in Norwegian, you have to have a lot more of it, meaning you have to construct the sentence in a different way, but it also, on the good side, gives it sort of very special Norwegian rhythm. Mm. And sometimes when I'm writing, it's, it, I mean, it's never I'm thinking, okay, now I need a very long <laughs> sentence there to just yeah. show how good I am at you know, <laughs> keeping uh, something afloat. It just happens when I'm writing, and maybe it also has to do with music, as I'm always li listening to different kinds of music as I'm writing, that suddenly something just clicks, and, and I feel that if I, if I put a full stop here, it's, it's really an intrusion of this rhythm. It really breaks the whole flow of the thing. Uh, yeah, there are no periods in symphonies. Yeah. And, and someone might refer to these very long sentences as, as rants, uh, but they are among the most um, 
you know, they're meticulously constructed. Mm. I have to go over and over and over and see, can I take this out to keep the rhythm? Can I do this and that? But I, li I like how a text, again, can, can, can use all these uh, tools to speed up or, sp or slow down or take you to the right or take you to the left. Right. Um, Bef before we um, started speaking, I was telling Johan, I, I went for a jog in um, Frogner Park this morning and I was just looking at all the crazy Vieglin statues, which I did the previous day because I just, uh, it's absolutely outrageous that one person made all those things. Mm. And the vitality is pretty enormous, but you also immediately have the sense that this person had to be a megalomaniac. You know, you, you, you see that and you see the, the kind of the fountain and the statue at the beginning and you think this is, this is a megalomaniac's giant dream. And one of the peculiar things, and again, I've only read the sections of it that I've had translated, but inside this, this great big book, um, it doesn't feel like a megalomaniac exercise. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to try to get you to praise yourself, but you know, uh, there, there, there was a generation of American novelists of which you have read many of them. Mm. William T. Ballman, David Foster Wallace, William Gaddis, other, other guys, they're all guys, um, uh, that created books like this that occasionally would tip into the, the megalomania. Mm. And I'm wondering, how do you write a book this long with themes about family and love and going home and war and spectacles of trauma mm. while also trying not to build Vigeland Park, yeah. you know? Which gives you a strange urge to invade Poland when you're... <laughs> 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 Which was something I was trying to avoid. <laughs> no, it, it's... It started out... Not small, but smaller. I think when I, when I first mentioned the idea for the project, which was the Cleveland project, to my editor, I said, I think this is it's, it's a longer book, but it's about four or five hundred pages or so. Uh, and for a long time, and, and because the way I work is I, I never finish the whole thing and then show my editor. I usually I'll write a hundred or two hundred pages and I just want her feedback in a way. And, and she's really good to, to use as a reader because she, she will never give you any directions. She would never say, what about doing something like this? Or what if this character did so? So she will never you know, meddle with the components of the story. She will just say, nah. Yeah. Which means you have to go back and write oh, no. more. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe she said, yeah. And then, yeah, the praise comes at the end, um, but then it comes and, and, and stays. Six years later. Yeah. But the th the th uh, what, what happened with this book was, for a long time, I, I was afraid that the book would, would become too long. So I kept telling her that, uh, you know, it's, it's a problem if it gets too long. People will think it's a macho thing and, uh, you know. Uh, and I kept cutting it or, or cutting corners, but it, it kept growing. And at one point, I think she just got tired of me uh, you know, apologizing for the length or being coy about it. So she said, it doesn't matter how long is it, as, as, as long as it's good, in a way, as long as, as everything in it uh, justifies its, its exterior, uh, ex you know. Um, and so, that was a that was a great relief, I think, when I decided okay, it, it it can be as big as it wants to be, as long as I'm <laughs> sure to take out what I what I took out. And I've mentioned this in almost every every time I've talked about the book. I've mentioned these 561 pages, which I kept you know track of that I took out uh, <laughs> from the book, <laughs> and those pages are not you know most of that uh, is really really shitty writing which you need to do to write any book. You, you have to write really bad stuff. But for this, I had to write a lot of shitty stuff to find the novel. And once I did it, uh, this freedom of, of space and, and form, it opened up a way of writing that was truly liberating. And also, uh, at, at a point, 
the novel had a, had a couple of, of working titles. The first one was, was Cleveland, obviously, and for a period it was also called Rothko Days, after the painter Mark Rothko, uh, which, amongst other things, uh, turned out to be a really difficult title for me, being from Stavanger, because I would have to call it Rothko Dagger, and <laughs> that didn't... I would ha get a lot of ha, huh? hmm? Um, so that ended up, up on the cutting floor, um, along with a lot of Rothko stuff in the book. But the thing with Rothko, which I really, really love, is you know all these these big, big murals and paintings he he did, and he wanted you to stay very close to the to the canvas, to be surrounded by it. And the whole idea of being surrounded by art, or also art as an actual place, was something I could take into the work with this novel and try to create a place or a home for the characters to live in, because they were all homeless in, in different ways, shapes and forms. It could be a place to live and a, and a home for me as a writer and hopefully for the reader as well. And I like the idea of being on page 600 and something of this novel, and you know what a novel is about, because it's about this guy who moves to the States, and da, da, da. but there's also these thousand other stories and you sort of lose track of it, and you, but you also keep track of it, but you're surrounded by it, and hopefully you're having a good time and fighting a little bit with it, etc., etc. And so I, that opened for a possibility to put a lot of stuff in there, and I think many writers will agree that what happens with a novel or any kind of, of book you publish is you struggle with it for so long and suddenly uh, you will sometimes experience that things click into place and you don't, um, I mean, and then suddenly everything fits, you know, in the jigsaw puzzle. And that happened, I think, with, with that book in the end, that, um, you know, all these Tetris blocks just yeah. came down. Came clicking together. Or at least it felt so, so for me. And then I wasn't afraid of it being too big anymore, and I wasn't afraid of it being too, you know, megalomaniac in any way, because I still felt that it was a very... At least in my opinion, it's a very quiet novel. In yes. A way. Before, uh, I mean, yeah. I have had sections from every different section yeah. look, that I looked at, and first of all, what's remarkable is that each one of them is completely aware that the reader is there. Mm. You know, so it's intense and gripping, but also um, you get you know, sucked into the, what, what's going on in the character's life. The other thing is that you know, novels this big often are, are sort of bench-pressing in front of you, like, look how much information mm. I know. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's also finally not demonstrative. It's not mm. demonstrating your facilities. It's using them. What and, that, we, yeah. that, and to me, that's the big difference between megalomania, which is like, look how many mm. different body types I can yeah. create and put in one park. Which is another different, di yeah. Which is another difficult thing, you know. Uh, speaking of 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 the novel being being quiet in a way, and this was one thing that I think David Foster Wallace said about Infinite Jest was, or maybe it was in a review. I can't remember. Anyway, someone said, maybe it was him, that he wanted the book to sound like two friends having a conversation late in the evening, you know, someone just telling the story in the middle of the night, you know, having a few beers or something, instead of standing there shouting it. And the other thing is, it's, it's difficult writing a book uh, in this day and age of, of this size and with that much information, because information is so readily available everywhere, you know. I can Google everything, I can... I can go to, the, to these different locations, but I can, and I also did, use a lot of, you know, Google Street View, driving around, um, seeing how things look, and, and researching, researching, and, and spending uh, months at a time on Wikipedia. But the problem is how to process that information, how, how to use it to something, as you say, more than just showing off how much, you know, Look how good I am at Googling stuff and just putting <laughs> in there. Uh, That's the title of my next novel. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of the work for this novel was first spending maybe... For, for instance, uh, as an example, there's this section in the book, uh, I think it's like three pages or something, about Uncle Owen in Fairfax and his, his paving, you know, putting down asphalt, paving the street. 
and I wanted that to be realistic in a way. And I've never done any serious paving. So I, I had <laughs> You're an amateur <laughs> paver? Yeah, just on a you know hobby basis. Uh, and so I researched it for quite some time and also read half a book about it because someone published a book about you know how to pave correctly. And so I had basically enough information about this to write a novel about someone who did that. And this is, again, this is not to show off to tell you how much I research or anything. It, it is just an example of you have to be sober about it and, and decide how much do I need mm. to either progress the story or to, uh, you know, um, reflect the character or something that, that's happening. And what will usually happen is there will be at least two pages of stuff that I just think is really, really interesting, for instance, about paving. And then, at a certain point, I'll admit to myself, regretfully, that most people would probably not be that interested in, in paving. <laughs> uh, and then I take it out. Yeah. But I think that, that is the real problem with writing in 2019. Uh, is, is everybody can know everything. Yeah. Well, this is about as much as we can fit into 50 minutes. There's, he has a novel that came out last year, which is a wonderful book of 12 or 13 little crime novels written yeah. by a, a person being annotated by the narrator with increasing interventionism. It's a great satire of academic specialty, but also mm. a demonstration of his virtuosity because they're wonderful examples of, of crime writing. Um, but you probably might have to go to other events, so I'm afraid we're probably going to have to stop here. Um, he, there might, are there copies of books here? Is there anyone here that actually works at the festival? No. No. Um, yeah, the copies of his books are over there, or you can just follow him out onto the street, and he'll tell you many interesting facts <laughs> about paving. Johan Harstad, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>